Well, one of the important things for businesses to be able to do before they get to the point to where they're operating internationally first is to conduct some, some analysis with regards to the different barriers to international trade. And the barriers to international trade really consist of things that prevent a business, obstacles if you will, that prevent a business from really operating to its full extent, to its fullest potential. Uh, and they can be a number of different things and I want to review some of the different categories of barriers to international trade because businesses need to spend a decent amount of time at least assessing what's happening in these areas in order for them to properly position their companies so that they can maybe prevent these from being obstacles to begin with or if they are maybe lessen the extent to which they negatively impact the business. And so a few categories of barriers to international trade. Uh, the first are what we refer to as socio-cultural barriers. And this is very similar to the, the social environment of business, right? Things that we consider external, of course, to the company, but things that certainly impact us. And so with <coughs> sociocultural barriers specifically, what we're looking at are how the kind of societal makeup has an effect on our particular business and how we need to alter the business to take into consideration the changes in society. And so some things that we would probably look at as far as changes, right? Uh, obviously, there are changes in society in terms of language. And so that's a very basic consideration, something that we would look at. Differences in language and have to adapt, obviously, and change not only how we you know, offer certain things. And so from menus to, to the print media that we use, uh, to the people that staff our particular locations, uh, to the way that we market, obviously, uh, those types of things would change. Uh, we also have to consider changes in preferences. You know, although we live in a global economy, there are still some differences with regards to preference in different areas of the world. Uh, so, for example, there are some dietary considerations that need to be addressed. And so certain areas of the world don't eat certain types of food uh, as a part of their culture. And so McDonald's, for example, doesn't offer pork products in certain areas because of those differences. And I'm not saying that a business needs to change everything that it's doing, but a business certainly needs to tailor what it's offering to the specific constituents that it's trying to attract almost. And that's a, a very, very important thing as well. Uh, you also have changes or differences, I should say, in terms of lifestyles. So here in the U.S., we're very what you call individualistic. Uh, we like to highlight our own accomplishments. We like to be praised and singled out individually, whereas in certain areas of the world, like Japan, for example, they're very collectivist, meaning that they like to be praised in groups, and they don't necessarily like to be singled out. And so those things have to be considered as well because that can affect ultimately how successful your business is. Now, in addition to sociocultural differences, uh, you also have to consider some changes in economics. Uh, economic barriers are a very, very important thing. Obviously, with economics, we're referring to uh, typically with the, the choices that people make, but specifically, some economic indicators can give us some help in this category. And so, first thing, we're going to look at things like population. Uh, population is very, very important. Uh, in, in turn, population usually is a very attractive piece for many businesses. So, you know, for example, you know, India has over a billion people. And so that is a significant attraction mechanism because that's a very, very large group of people to have access to that could potentially purchase your product. Now, with, with India, the, the big issue there with that population is not only serving that population, but the infrastructure that goes along with that. 
infrastructure meaning roads, different ways of, of getting products from point A to point B. And the infrastructure in India, for those that know, is very, very bad. Uh, it's very, very difficult to get supplies. Uh, Walmart, for example, is running into a lot of issues, uh, obviously expanding into India because it simply, it, it, its supply chain is dependent upon being able to get products to its stores in, in large quantity. But based upon the infrastructure and the way that the road system is, you know, you have trucks that, you know, semi trucks can't drive there. It has to be smaller pickup trucks and they can't go over 20, 30 miles an hour just because of the quality of the actual roads. And that, you know, prevents them getting products to locations on time, prevents or it causes spoilage. So products tend to go bad, especially if they obviously are, you know, types of food. And so that creates a host of issues that could be a potential problem there that needs to be considered. Another one is per capita income or the amount of money essentially made on a per person basis. Uh, in countries that have a very, very low per capita income, right, that equates to a, a lack of spending power. And so a particular business trying to expand has to consider, well, do these people even have the ability to purchase my product, right? You wouldn't have a, you know, product maker like Coach, for example, expanding to a particular market where the you know, per capita income is like $300 per person. It doesn't make any sense. That's their whole basically year salary for the most part. Uh, and so that has to be considered as well because you not only have to make sure that, you know, there's a great number of people, that's awesome. But at the same point in time, do they have the financial means necessary to purchase my product? That can certainly be a barrier uh, if it isn't addressed. All right, in addition to economic barriers, we also have what we call political and legal barriers. And the important thing here is that a, a country will, or a country's government, I should say, will, will set the conditions for which a business can operate. And so businesses have to operate within those set of conditions. And this can either be good or bad. It can be extremely freeing because there's very limited regulation or it can be very difficult to operate in. So for example, uh, Google has been attempting to get access into China for some time. And from what you probably know about the Chinese government is they are, you know, somewhat controlling. They've, they've lessened uh, over the years, uh, but they still are fairly involved in, you know, business matters and what's done. And so uh, one of the things that China has is state-run media. And so they like to be able to, you know, kind of regulate what is said about the government and those different types of things. Uh, and so that kind of runs contrary to what Google's mission is, right? If you look at their mission statement, it's to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Uh, well, if they're being asked to censor search results so that you only find things that the government wants you to find, does that run contrary to Google's mission? And the answer is yes. Uh, and so at one point, I think it was in 2010, Google completely removed itself from China. They said, you know what, the regulations here, we, we can't provide the service the way we want to provide it and the way that we envisioned it, uh, you know, without, you know, kind of running contrary to what our, our moral beliefs are based upon what you want from us. And so at one point, they completely removed themselves from China altogether, uh, just stating that it was just too much hassle and they couldn't accomplish what their mission was. Uh, now, since then, they've kind of come back and have kind of resumed talks with regards to, okay, you know, China, there's over a billion people, so a huge population. This is a great market opportunity, especially when you talk about advertising dollars. So, you know, really, we probably should still have access to China. And how do we do that, though? And so they've re re resumed talks uh, on how to overcome these barriers and still offer the service in a way that is, you know, the way that is fitting and the way that can fits with ultimately their vision. Uh, but at the same point in time, the Chinese government represents a significant political and legal barrier to entry because they can significantly impact how the business actually operates. And that's a very, very key consideration there. Uh, you also have some issues where some countries can confiscate property, right? So they essentially nationalize 
all of your property and now they own it. And that can be a very, very big issue there. And we had a, in large part, that was a, a big issue we had with Cuba that led to our embargo with them. Uh, is that they nationalize a lot of the properties of U.S. citizens. And that wasn't obviously a very good thing. You can't just take what's not yours. And so that caused, obviously, a deterioration in the relationship. Other things to consider besides, you know, simply the government itself are things like uh, quotas. A quota is a, a restriction on the number of products that can enter a particular country. And this can be used to protect your industries. For example, in the 1980s, the Japanese automobile manufacturers were producing you know, vehicles uh, for and selling them for less than the U.S. automobile manufacturers can actually make them for. You know, there's no way we can compete. And so to protect the U.S. auto industry from, you know, basically kind of going bankrupt and, and going out of business and losing all those jobs, what the U.S. government did is they implemented quotas. And so they only allowed a certain number of certain types of vehicles into the U.S. in any given year. And so that reduced the, the supply of those particular products. Uh, that way we didn't flood the entire market here with these inexpensive Japanese-made automobiles. And so that's, that's one way, that's one type of kind of barrier, of course. And that's one way a government can try and protect its own industries. And we've seen that happen you know, over the course of history. Another thing that can be used besides quotas are what we call tariffs. Uh, tariff is essentially a tax on products that enter a country. And so how this works is let's say there's a 10% a, a tariff on Japanese made automobiles. And so once those automobiles are shipped in the U.S., then there's a 10% tariff. And what that does is that causes those companies to increase their prices. And so what we're doing is we're by causing them to increase their prices, we're making it so that the price that they charge is somewhat more competitive to the price that maybe a U.S. automobile manufacturer can assemble them and, and sell them for, right? And that was a very big thing that happened during the 80s. And to an extent, we still have quotas and, and tariffs to this day. Uh, but a lot of companies can bypass those by shifting operations into the U.S., and if things are manufactured here, obviously there's not a tax to bring it in here since it's already created here. And likewise, if it's created here, you can't restrict the number necessarily because you're not shipping it in. It's already created here. Another thing government can do are what we call subsidies. And subsidies are commonly referred to as a uh, reverse tax. Uh, it's basically a payment made by government to help certain domestic businesses compete with foreign firms and so this certainly happened during the 80s uh, government has subsidized you know a lot of a lot of industries it subsidized the solar industry for a long period of time and so it's essentially government's way of trying to level the playing field assisting its own domestic industries so that they can essentially compete internationally uh, now the most extreme form of any type of you know trade barrier if you will is an embargo and I mentioned this before with regards to Cuba. An embargo essentially uh, prevents uh, goods of any kind from coming in from a country. And this is also to and from. And so typically we don't have many embargoes going on. I think at this point in time the only embargo we do have is with Cuba and that's for reasons that you know they nationalize a lot of property and different things and obviously we don't necessarily agree with the way that their government kind of controls things as well uh, so in this particular case we prevent any goods from going to them or any goods coming from them and so it's almost like an economic stranglehold if you will we're, we're kind of you know crush them economically by not allowing their businesses access to our markets but also not allowing their citizens access to our goods and so that's a significant way to put kind of strain on a government is you, you know, limit them economically so their people become so frustrated that at some point they, you know, kind of vote in a new government or overthrow 
their particular government. So uh, all of these three items represent some key barriers to international trade, and they have to be considered, obviously, to be operating successfully. You have to consider the way the government kind of structures things if you're going to operate within those kind of confines, if you will. You have to understand the economics of the country you're going into so you can position your product in a way that is going to sell. Uh, and you have to certainly be able to tailor your product to the differences in the culture of that particular constituency as well. And so rarely will a business just look at one or two of these. Usually we're looking at each and every one of these elements in order to assess adequately you know, what the level of competitiveness is in a particular market.